welcome to another edition of uh, Kyle Meredith With. It's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org, Consequence, and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks as always for making your way here. Check out the series. You know what to do. Like what you see, what you hear. Hit that subscribe button. I, uh, I put out three new interviews every single week, so it's a great way to keep up with all of your favorite artists. And I am so excited today to have Scott Neustadter here to talk about Daisy Jones and the Six. I've been dying to talk about this with someone. Hello, Scott. What's happening, Kyle? Thanks for having me. It is a pleasure. Um, I fell in love with this story so hard. Uh, I hadn't read the book, actually. My wife had read the book, and uh, and she was telling me the whole time that she was uh, reading it and listening to the audio. Said, You're going to love this. You're going to love this. And then I had uh, Suki Waterhouse on the series last year, and we were talking about it, and she said, you're going to love this. And so finally, I see the show, and it's my favorite thing that I've seen maybe in years. Seriously, wow, what you all have done awesome. is amazing. Thank you so much. That's great to hear. I, I uh, We put the first three up last week. We've got three more coming this week, and uh, we're very excited for people to check it out. Yeah. So l- let's get back to the start here. This starts as a book, uh, Taylor Jenkins Reid, who puts it out. Uh, how does it make its way into your lab? So back in 2017, actually, um, Taylor finished writing uh, the book uh, and sent it to her manager, uh, like as a galley in an email. Um, he read it. Uh, it was totally, you know, unpublished, unfinished, uncorrected. Um, and for whatever reason, um, Brad thought of me uh, because I guess we we had talked about music in the past. He knew I was kind of a music junkie um, and he thought I'd get a kick out of it. So he he sent it my way. Um, uh, you know, rumors, Fleetwood Mac, obviously something that I <laughs> care about passionately and really love. And uh, I started reading this book uh, pretty convinced I was not going to love it because how could you outdo the drama and the greatness of, of that true story. Um, but I got about 100 pages in and I was like, this is fantastic. Uh, and I did something I wasn't supposed to do. My, my wife had just started um, running film and television for Reese Witherspoon's new company, Hello Sunshine. And uh, I knew they were looking for projects. And I said to her, have you heard about this Daisy book? Because I know you're going to love it. And I know Reese is going to love it. Because Reese and I had once talked about Stevie Nicks and our mutual love of, of that story. So I said, uh, you got to get your hands on this book. And um she did. And then together we kind of did the full court press on Taylor and convinced her to, to go with us to make the TV show. Yeah. It's not easy to make a rock and roll movie show anything. I mean, I think we can count on just a few fingers, the great ones that have been made over the years that show what it's actually like to be in a band. I, I think almost famous for me is like the, the crowning achievement up there. And and you've had some good shows in the past you know, decade or so, but but none of them really hit the mark. This one, this one does it. This one is exactly like that had to be part of the conversation because again, there's not like you got a ton that goes, oh yeah, we can do this. We can make a rock and roll movie. No, it's true. We we always said that the bar was very high, the bullseye very small. Um, but if somehow we could we could do it, uh, people would really pay attention. Um, and obviously, Almost Famous is an amazing example of of how to do it right. Um, what's interesting about Almost Famous is that it's about outsiders you know it's the it's William's perspective and um, he's not really a part of the band and he's he's along for the ride and it's about that sort of disconnect this one was going to very much be about the artists themselves and and the turmoil they're going through and um, how they process their feelings and they put it into their work uh, which is not something that we'd really seen a lot uh, before and we knew that um, to do that right was going to require you know a a big group of of like-minded individuals um, to kind of drill down on the authenticity um, and do something that um, most people would probably think, you know, the minutia wouldn't be as interesting, um, but we wanted to kind of make it as as dramatic and as um, as fun as we could. Yeah. I mean, I've been in bands when I was younger, you know, high school, a little bit out of high school, and there's a little bit of PTSD watching this because <laughs> right. you go back because it is dramatic if you let it be you know it is there but i can also say that uh, i've never seen the songwriting process authentically put into fiction in such a way and i don't know what the trick is and i don't know if you can answer but how'd you do that when no one else could <laughs> well, that's, that's very nice of you to say um i think we just were really interested in that part of it and and wanted to zero in on how does this happen Um, you know, uh, especially when it comes to songs that are inspired by heartbreak or frustration or, you know, whatever they're going through, um, you know, really started with what if your favorite band in the world only got together because they were trying to impress a girl 
And, you know, when you think about sort of um, the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and, and just, you know, the biggest bands in the world, there was an impetus for why they got together. What was the, you know, they, they had to express themselves somehow. And um, all of that was just such fertile ground for, for drama for us that, uh, and just in reading this book, um, you know, it's, there's so many love stories involved mm -hmm. and, but it's all filtered through the songwriting and um, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're coded messages to each other. Uh, and that will take the, the music and just give it another level that, um, you know, you might not hear if you're just listening on the radio. Yeah. And I want to get to the songs here in a minute, but but you, of course, had to find the people to to play those songs, to to embody those songs. And uh, there's not one person that I'm watching this. And I'm like, oh, I don't feel like they're like everybody was right on the mark. Uh, I would love to hear about that part, too. Who are you looking for? What type of people were you looking for? How many people did you see? Yeah, there was a, a very long list of of, uh, of people who read for the show, um, and there was a you know a conversation that we had about whether or not we should hire musicians who could also act, uh, or actors who could sort of play music. Um, we decided to go with the actors because I feel like eighty five percent of this is uh, you know TV drama. Um, but uh, that said, they had to convince you that they were a real band, or the whole thing falls apart. Um, we were supposed to shoot in April of 2020. And had we done that, I feel like we would have probably needed um, to a little magic to convince you. Um, but because of the pandemic, everything shut down for about 18 months. And these actors who had gotten the parts um, and some of them were in England and some of them were in LA and some of them were in New York, they were sort of spread out all over the place. They didn't take time off. They, they actually used this um, as an opportunity to get better at their instruments, to, to kind of, zoom together and and just talk and uh, and shoot the you know what to become kind of like a band so by the time that they we we were rolling cameras they really felt like a unit the, the way a real band does and and there wasn't that much fakery involved which was unexpected for for us i have to say yeah yeah when it finally got around to it what, what were the i mean jam sessions i'm guessing that was a part of uh, being on the set they were doing Zoom jam sessions for a while, yeah, uh, which we have some video of, which was amazing. Um, and uh, and then when we finally were able to all be in the same room, they had like a, a very intensive band camp um, where we had um, our music supervisors and our music producers kind of teach them uh, how to move and uh, how to kind of, you know, position their bodies on stage, all the things that these guys had never really done before. Um, and then, you know, in this particular program, unlike most others, when you when you see Will Harrison's fingers playing a G chord on the guitar, um, that's where they're supposed to be. I mean, everything we couldn't use takes where the fingers were not in the right places. Um, so we we really strove for that kind of authenticity. And, and I hope it comes through. Yeah. And you mentioned consultants. I kept seeing Kim Gordon's name up there. Are we talking Kim Gordon, Kim Gordon, Sonic Youth, Kim the, Gordon? The, the Kim Gordon, yes. Kim Gordon is a friend of um, of my co-showrunner, Will Grams. And, and obviously Kim Gordon was in a band with her husband. So there's a uh, fraught, you know, drama and her and that that we were interested in. And, and she sat in the writer's room with us um, multiple times and uh, told stories. And, you know, anytime we would pitch an idea that she would uh, call BS on, we would have to throw it out. Um, but uh, yeah, that was the kind of, we, we really had a lot of experts around who could talk to us about this, their experiences and, and what was true. And, and you know, um, that was always the, that was always the North Star for us. Yeah, it's, it, you made me, my brain have to twist inside out because I, as I'm watching it, I think the last, because I've had Kim on here quite a few times. And I thought the last time I had Kim on here, we were talking about what she listened to at home and she kept saying rumors and Fleetwood Mac <laughs> and Tusk. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's like, wait a second, what was going on here? Yeah, uh, incredible. Makes sense. Yeah, but you go with Patti Smith for the theme song. How did that uh, land? Yeah, I, I wanted a theme song that had a lot of drama to it, that sort of was telling this story without really telling the story, um, and came up with that idea pretty early on, and then just spent months and months trying to beat it, and no song beat it. No song kind of captured the the magic and the drama and the energy um, it's just a great TV theme song, actually. Don't get tired of it. I mean, and I guess it's really obvious why you wouldn't say go for a Fleetwood Mac song. Uh, on the, I mean, was that ever thought of? Well, there's a there's a secret Fleetwood Mac song somewhere in the series that that will surprise you. Um, uh, because for a really long time, we were pretending that um, Fleetwood Mac is not a band that exists in this world. Uh, let's not let's not go there. And then uh, our editor dropped dropped a song in there in a certain spot, and we were like, whoa, the the 
the power was so intense that uh, that we ran with it. So I, I hope it's a cool surprise that people will, will enjoy when they get to episode nine. Right. Well, into the music as we're talking about. So Aurora, the album exists. The songs exist. You've all brought them to life, uh, Blake Mills and and all the co-writers. What? Let's let's. Uh, I'll start once again a bit broad. Let's. How did that whole process happen? Because again, you've got to make something out of nothing, but also something that sort of almost kind of exists. Yeah, it's interesting when you read a novel about music, um, and they're describing songs and they're describing you know the power of a, of a record. It's uh, your brain can make it up in your head, and it'll you know you just go with it. Um, but that was not going to work in the TV version. We actually had to make the music, and we had to make the music good enough that all of the all of the adjectives that are used to describe it, classic, unforgettable, timeless, all those really intense uh, and very intimidating adjectives, we had to make them apply somehow. Um, so we, we were never going to do that. None of us are songwriters, um, Taylor included. And so we, want to, we went and uh, sought out kind of... Um, Music producers and, and songwriters who were who were down for this experiment, um, and we ended up with with Blake Mills and, and Tony Berg, who operate out of Sound City, um, and we sat down with them, you know, in the room where Mick Fleetwood first heard Lindsey Buckingham play the guitar, and we said, "Here's what we're gonna need," um, and they said, "That sounds like a fun a fun thing." We we you know uh, they've never tried this before, but to write in character. Uh, seemed like a an entertaining thing, and, and Blake was going to ask a lot of his friends to co-write with him. And you know, he's got a lot of great, amazing friends: uh, Marcus Mumford and Phoebe Bridgers and Jackson Brown. Uh, and we were like, we were knew we were in really good hands. I'm not sure they knew just how hard work this was going to be and how many songs we were going to need. But um, we worked together for you know two years and change, uh, and it was really a, a wonderful process. Yeah, because because even beyond Aurora, there are songs even beyond the album i mean how many in total was there did I you think it's around 24 uh that we we used but they probably wrote closer to 30 yeah. um, and blake blake wanted to write everything he wanted to write the simone jackson disco songs he wanted to write the sort of psychedelic band that opens up for the dunn brothers in pittsburgh uh he wanted to write every single original song that is mentioned in this um and we kept saying you know like we could we could farm this out we could get another it's not that not that big a song you know like it's only going to be heard through the speakers and he's like i don't care um and he he did all of it and i think the the aurora album's amazing and then eventually we'll have a soundtrack record of all the other ancillary songs and and it's a really amazing crop of of songs that we're we're so excited about i'm really excited to hear that because th there were songs in there what you like like even you know like the sixes first hits and I'm, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, you know, before before Daisy comes along and they've got their first taste of it. Like there are those songs and you're like, oh, yeah, that that didn't make the album. Where does where does that exist at this point? Yeah, what's what's fun is that and, and we talked about this uh, at length. Um, the Dunn brothers have a certain sound. Even the six has a certain sound before Daisy gets there and she changes the sound. And then Daisy's writing a certain kind of song before she meets Billy and the band and it has more of a singer songwriter sort of uh, quality to it also. And it has to sound different when they come together. And so you've got three very different sounds that are happening um, and you can track it with your ears. And it's really like Blake did such an amazing job to kind of tell the story just through the songs themselves um, that I think, uh, you know, that it'll have repeat listens um, and you'll get even more out of it than, than if you're just watching the show, you know, cold. And, and not even just the sounds from that, but you have the different versions of the songs themselves. And I think that's what I was like, maybe most impressed with the songwriting because, because you had to, he or whoever had to create a version that was almost there. You know, it's like, uh, how do you pull that off? And by the way, to, as a viewer, to know it's not there, like, oh my God, it's, it, it reminded me of watching the Get Back documentary and there they are starting on the song. And it's so frustrating to know that it's not there yet. Just, just get there already. <laughs> Yeah, that was a huge influence on us too, and and uh, I think showing that is very important. Um, you know, you you have the finished product, but then this series is going to show you what it was like before, uh, and kind of undercut this genius myth that everything comes out fully formed. Um, I think it was important to us to show that it is a process, and you have to work at it. And these two characters have a very different type of work ethic, um, and hopefully, it's very interesting and entertaining to watch them do it. But um, the the, the process itself is kind of what the show is about. And uh, and yeah, I, I think um, I think Blake did an unbelievable job 
convincing you uh, that it's that it's authentic and real. Speaking of convincing, um, you're going to get them all to go out on tour. We're going to see that. I mean, we'd love nothing more than that. It's probably at this point, um, I think all these actors are going to go on to do such in incredible stuff and be in high demand. I wonder if the schedule will ever work, but um, it would be a dream to, to get them together and perform. And we know they can do it. We we had them perform a show for us before we started filming to kind of prove to to us and to themselves that they could that they could do it. Uh, and they made the set list and they didn't have any accompaniment. They did it all on their own. Um, we made them kind of get into costume and get up on stage and, and play a show for about 50 to 60 people. Uh, and they nailed it. And it was it was incredible. Yeah. Well, as much as I am a fan, and I mean this, of when someone says it's a limited series, uh, I'm like, I like a beginning and an ending. This is one of the times where I went, well, does it have to be? Because the second scene you know, is a reunion. Just it makes the sense. I mean, like. Would would you want that to happen? Would you allow that to happen? If yeah, no. If there is an interest um, and a desire to see more, I feel like that um, I'd love these characters. Uh, I would be interested in in seeing where it goes as well, and uh, obviously interested in another twelve to fifteen songs uh, of original music from Blake and his group. Um, that would be pretty cool. Uh, but there's also the version of this, which is you know a different band in a different time in a different um, environment. Um, which would also be really cool to watch. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things I love about it is is they're in a very specific kind of pocket in the 70s. They're doing that Southern California, you know, soft rock pop sound. Uh, but all around them is this this other scene that's happening. You know, you've got punk is coming and disco is happening. And, and there's just so many different genres of music that would be fun to to do this kind of story in. Um, in the future, if some if such a thing was of desire to anyone. <laughs> well, I, I completely trust you all at this point. So if the same team is doing it, I, I, I'm in on that. Uh, and, and you know, fortunately or unfortunately for all of these actors, they're now going to get a taste of what it's like to have ever been in a famous band who did break up because for the next however long, it's going to be so like, so when's the reunion going to happen? Because that's what that's what they always get now. It's, it's true. You had Suki on. Suki's touring and, and has a record out and she's she's a full blown rock star. I mean, I think when we started this, she was playing the piano with two fingers. Um, it's pretty it's pretty amazing to watch. Yeah. And what incredible music that she's making. Uh, seriously, yeah. the album, the EP and everything that she's done. Uh, Scott, seriously, you are a part of one of the best things that I've seen in such a long time. Daisy Jones and the Six. This is so good. So good. Thank you so much for uh, the work you've done and taking the time to talk about it. Thank you, Carlos. Great to great to talk to you. And thanks to my guest. Also, thanks to you for uh, for checking out the episode in the series. Before you get out of here, hit that subscribe button. Again, uh, you get three brand new interviews every single week. New and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at uh, right here on YouTube or, of course, anywhere in podcast land, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, NPR, or WFPK.org as well. A great way to keep up with your favorite artists and discover new ones as well. Then after that, actually head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, bonus interviews, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern at WFPK.org. Consequence has your music and film news. You can also find me on the social media spots, uh, Facebook, Instagram, mostly on Twitter. All three of them, the address is at Kyle Meredith. Do hope you like and follow along. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time.